Hello, and welcome to The Backstory. Today, the backstory on all things water-related in Colorado, and more specifically, to Longmont, Colorado. My name's Tim Waters. I am your host of The Backstory, and I'm joined today by three experts on water policy, uh, water conservation, water usage, water rights, which may be the biggest of all of the water-related uh, issues or knowledge that, that's relevant to uh, water today. And I'm going to introduce them as you see them on the screen. Ken Hewson is Longmont's Water Resources Manager, and Ken has been in these conversations before. Ken, welcome. Uh, we know that you're in the middle of all those, all those issues for us as a community. Jeff Drager is Director of Engineering for Northern Water. Uh, Jeff, thanks for joining us today. And the people will recognize, people in Longmont will recognize the face of Del Rademacher, our deputy, uh, deputy city manager, and uh, with his fingerprints on all things public works and natural resources related in Longmont for, for decades. So thanks to all three of you. I know you have a lot to do, um, and I know this is a big issue, and you, you probably are immersed in these issues day in and day out. So take a step back and, and educate the rest of us, I, I think, is a real gift to the community. I know for me, just in my role in the community and the various conversations I find myself in, the question about water, especially as people have heard about the declaration of a shortage on the, on the Colorado and its implications for the lower Colorado basin states, uh, that's triggered a number of questions for folks about what that means. What does it mean for the upper Colorado? What does it mean for Longmont? Um, and so what we're gonna do in this first segment or the first episode of a two-part here is uh, kind of drill down on some of those issues with these experts and then we're going to come back in a second episode, and, and we're, we'll, we'll record in a, a week or so. Uh, so you'll get answers to questions about what does it really mean to you or to us in Longmont, both near term and long term. So we have water policy, water rights, uh, water portfolio, and then implications. So uh, just in on the issue of uh, what's happening, right? What's happening lower Colorado, upper Colorado? I'm going to defer to you guys. Jeff, are you the first one to pick this up? Is or is it one of our Colorado uh, or Longmont experts? I think I got the short straw here, right. Tim. I, I Thanks, got a little Jeff. nervous when I saw your questions. I think we passed this around to about three different people here trying to find someone who's willing <laughs> to answer these questions. Because they're hard questions. And uh, there, it is difficult times on the Colorado River now. Uh, as I said, it's a hard subject. Our board hasn't made any real final decisions on this, but I'll try and give you my kind of personal opinion on what's going on here. You know, the, you asked about the shortage on the Colorado River that was declared uh, by the Bureau of Reclamation. And as your listeners might know, the Colorado River is really governed by the 1922 Colorado River Compact. And that compact allocated water in the Colorado River between the lower basin states, which are California, Arizona, and Nevada. And they got about, they got seven and a half million acre feet and they implied that the upper basin would get seven and a half million acre feet, but the upper basin had a requirement to make sure that they delivered seven and a half million acre feet to the lower basin every year. So really our requirement in the upper basin is to deliver that downstream. So that's Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, and uh, New Mexico are the upper basin states that have to do that. So, you know, Colorado as being part of that is, is, is governed by this Colorado River Compact, it gets more complicated. There are other agreements. There's actually an upper Colorado River compact for the four upper basin states that has more rules about what happens in the upper basin states. Um, and then there have been some other things that happened that are more related to the shortage. In 2007, the seven basin states and the Bureau of Reclamation uh, entered into the interim guidelines that would uh, allow them to operate uh, the Colorado River. And it really talked about sharing water between Lake Powell and Lake Mead, the two big storage reservoirs on the Colorado River. It had requirements in there for when water level in Lake Mead was low and it was high in Lake Powell, Lake Powell would deliver more water downstream. If it was the other way around, then Lake Powell would reduce their diversions. But also in that document, kind of hidden in there that people didn't talk about much were these requirements for shortages. So there was a requirement in the interim guidelines that said if water levels get below a certain point in Lake Mead, the lower basin states will be required to take a shortage. We hit those water levels this year, 
or at least I, I, we haven't actually hit those water levels, but the Bureau of Reclamation's computer models project that we will hit that water level next year. And so that uh, based on those water model results, they have said that Arizona and Nevada will need to have a shortage in their deliveries next year. That, that shortage got uh, increased a little more a couple of years ago as this drought has continued to, to drag on and the water levels have dropped. Uh, the, the upper and lower basin states also entered into what's called a drought contingency plan. And that plan uh, actually increased the levels of shortage that were in those interim guidelines. So it, it gets pretty complicated, but in essence, what happened here is the Bureau of Reclamation looks at water levels. This year is a very bad year. Uh, I think they think the inflows into Lake Powell are only about a third of normal. Uh, when the Bureau of Reclamation runs their computer models, they see very low water levels in Lake Mead next year, and that requires these shortages. So in essence, the shortages are declared by the Bureau of Reclamation, and it's based on Lake Mead water levels and those agreements that I discussed. So, so it's the Bureau that, that is authorized to make that call. Yes. And then, and then all, all the parties to the compact have to adapt uh, right. to what those implications are. Right. Um, and it's, it's different. I uh, just, I'll say real quickly in the lower basin, those three states get their water delivered out of Lake Mead and the Bureau is essentially in charge of that. And they make those deliveries and they do what happens in the upper basin. It's a little bit different. Uh, we don't have a reservoir above us to have the Bureau make deliveries out of. And so we have uh, requirements in the compact, but really our water rights are allocated and, and authorized by the states themselves. So here in Colorado, we're authorized by the states, but we have commitments based on that compact. In some of the news reporting uh, in the days following that declaration, there have been a couple of newspaper articles um, I, I think probably forecast, maybe it's speculating rather than forecasting on what the implications will be for certain members or populations in those lower states, farmers, uh, uh, residents, uh, um, you know, other commercial ventures of your, you know, landscaping business or those kinds of things. Uh, wh what is, what have you heard about what those implications might be for them? Because as we hear about those here in Longmont, you know, people yeah. start to worry about, well, what does that mean for me? And I know we're going to get to that later, but what, right. what, what will we be hearing just kind of to help people anticipate the kind of speculation? I think what we're going to be hearing, Nevada is probably pretty easy. Nevada doesn't use their full allocation right now anyway. So even though they are required to take a shortage, they really won't be seeing any less water delivered to Nevada. But Arizona is going to see maybe about a half a million acre feet less water than their allocation on the Colorado River. And they've tried to figure out a way to make that work, but in essence, they are going to reduce uh, water deliveries mostly to agriculture. So they have different levels of agriculture. Arizona has uh, agriculture that's operated by the Indian tribes down there. They have a regular uh, other agriculture as well. And they have they're going to see shortages to agriculture. They are going to move some water around. They have ways to transfer water from the Salt River project in Arizona into some of those farmers. But in essence, you're going to see farmers take the biggest hit on uh, those reduced water deliveries to Arizona. So that's a kind of hierarchy in terms of in terms of use or you know the first affected agriculture yeah. and then and then other other forms of industry. I remember when growing up. When, there, when Arizona, uh, the Phoenix area where I grew up, um, uh, all, the, all of the concerns about the Salt River project and, and um, you know, would that be sufficient for Arizona's water for the, the long term? And then that Salt River pro or the um, Central Arizona project, right? That, right? that ditch, right? That Carl Hayden, when he was in the Senate, uh, helped to broker a deal on that still has a lot of water in it because my, my, one of my brothers lives right next to it. For it for that for a project like that the 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 the, uh, the um, a Central Arizona project uh, will Arizonans you think see that kind of water flowing through that ditch? There will be water flowing through that ditch, but it will be less than it has yeah. been in the past, and most of that shortage is going to the Central Arizona project. And you know what's interesting about that project when 
to get that authorized, they had to cut a deal with California to get their legislator to vote for the project. And that deal was that Arizona would be the first one to take shortages on the Colorado River uh -huh. in advance of California. So that's why when you see these low water levels, Arizona is the first one that's, that's being uh -huh. hit. Well, there's the, there's the basis for it. Um, you suppose anybody at the, in those days uh, ever anticipated what we're experiencing now? I don't know if they did or not. I think they didn't. And I think even, you know, I mentioned these interim guidelines that came out in 2007, and those kind of came around after the 2002 drought. And people said, well, we ought to think about what might happen if the water supply, you know, stays yeah. low like this. And they came up with these rules. But I don't think even then they expected it to get as bad as it has over the yeah. last 20 years. I think they're surprised. And I think Arizona has always known that they were the first to take a shortage and they've always been uh, very carefully, you know, keeping track of the rules and what's going on to make sure they get as much water as they can. Yeah, well, having grown up there, there were, there were lots of folks who wondered about all that, that residential development around man-made water features, right? <laughs> around lakes and canals. It's like, how sustainable is that? And I think they're having to answer that question probably now, all these decades right. later. So there's also the upper Colorado right? Uh, right. Headwaters in, in the state of Colorado. And, and there then are implications for us based on in terms of what gets diverted, how much gets diverted, where it gets diverted, how it gets measured, all those kinds of things. Um, uh, who wants to kind of pick up that storyline uh, in terms of uh, the, the upper basin states and Colorado in particular? I guess I can start. You guys jump in if you want. You're you're being very quiet over there, so you you're welcome to jump in if you want. Yeah, but, you guys uh, didn't draw that that long a straw. You've got short straws too, so you got to get into this. <laughs> we, uh, you know, um, in the in the upper basin, we we don't have any shortage requirements or anything right now, and so but you are see, seeing newspaper articles and you're hearing people with these perceptions. Water users in the lower basin are saying, "Hey, we have to take shortages." you guys should take shortages in the upper basin. So we're setting up this kind of uh, negotiation that's, that's going on right now. We don't have any requirements to take shortages now. We have to, as I mentioned earlier, we have to deliver 75 million acre feet every 10 years on a, on a sort of seven and a half million acre feet on a, every year average for uh, down to the lower basin. And we're well over that number. And so because we're well over that number, we're a few years away from actually having the compact tell us that we really need to, you know, we actually might need to have reduced uh, deliveries or reduced water use. So there's, uh, you know, from that perspective, there's not a, there's not a likelihood in the next couple of years anyway, that that's going to happen, but there is pressure for people to start using less water and related to uh, the shortage down in Lake Mead, you might've also seen another story that the Bureau of Reclamation required some releases out of some upper basin reservoirs. So they, they released some water out of Flaming Gorge, Blue Mesa and Navajo reservoir that's gonna go down to Lake Powell and try to increase the water levels in Lake Powell. And I think that number is, uh, I had it written down here. It's, it's 125,000 acre feet out of Flaming Gorge, 36,000 out of Blue Mesa and 20,000 out of Navajo. So the Bureau's already, you know, kind of Release. reacting from that type of thing and saying we're going to start taking some actions in the upper basin uh, maybe to keep Lake Powell water levels high. There are concerns that if Lake Powell gets below a certain level it's harder to generate power and yeah. I've also seen an article this week that power uh, generation in Lake Powell will be lower than previous years. So those type of impacts are going to hit us right now but we don't see at least right now we don't see in the next few years any legal requirement for the upper basin states to to cut their usage uh, but there is a lot of uh, discussion going on the states looking at things called uh, demand management is there a way to for the upper basin to reduce their demand to make sure they deliver that water downstream um, you know there are a lot of discussions ongoing in that regard if you if you think about it a little bit you know the lower basin gets their water delivered out of Lake Mead, and they get it every year, and the Bureau delivers it to them every year. Um, up here in the upper basin, we take shortages all the time, actually. If, if 
Right. If your water right's on the St. Vrain, if the hydrology is low, you take a shortage. If we have a water right on the Colorado River and there's not enough water in the river, we take a shortage. So we do take shortages all the time, even right now. And I don't think people in the lower basin recognize that or really want to admit that that's going on. But we, we are taking shortages. And I think ultimately there is going to be a, a, you know, a stronger push to conserve more water, be more efficient with water. And we'll see what, what happens if the, if the water supplies continue to, to be as low as they have the last few years because of climate change or whatever else, you know, we may then see some legal requirements for what might happen here. So Jeff, I think you, you bring up a really an excellent point on uh, uh, in particular Colorado versus um, um, the lower states. And uh, you'll probably remember when we were on that tour uh, a year or two ago, uh, where we toured down all the way down to the Imperial Valley in, in California. Yeah. Um, frankly, what I came away from on that tour, I was struck by, um, frankly, the ease of which they were able to receive their water in any given year and the certainty that they had to receive their water. As you mentioned, they, they were less, far less um, dependent upon uh, mother nature or the hydrology in any given year as we are. And then secondly, um, I don't know about you, but I was not real impressed with the uh, level of conservation or even the, the desire to conserve uh, in, in some of those uh, uh, different users on the, on the lower Colorado. Um, the one that sticks with me and, and, and I can't get out of my head was uh, at the Imperial Valley. Uh, where, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they're using anywhere between two and a half to three million acre feet of water out of the Colorado every year. Yes. And, um, and I think that compares, that, is that about the same amount as the entire state of Colorado takes out of the Colorado, or is it even more than what we take out? Uh, I mean, that's a good point, Dale. Our, our numbers right now is that we think Colorado takes about two and a half million acre feet right. of the Colorado River. So we, uh, so we have and, one irrigation valley, uh, the Imperial Valley. Granted, it's it's a it's a large right ir 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 irrigation yeah. district. Um, unfortunately, what I what I also observed was that one of the primary crops that they were growing down there was alfalfa. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. And, uh, and they were the growing grasses that they were then exporting to Japan or to China. Or China, to yes. To feed cattle. So if, if there's a need to conserve, which I believe there is, and I believe we all have a duty to conserve, down to each of our taps, right? Each of us have that responsibility. Um, it's pretty clear to me there's, there's, there's a lot of opportunity for conservation that can happen in those lower states. It really comes down to the will to do it, the desire to do it, and then, of course, the, uh, the legal uh, reasons to either do it or not do it. And it's all embroiled uh, and tied up in these long-term uh, agreements that, um, uh, frankly, no one's willing to let go of, right? And um, uh, I, I'm hopeful, you know, I tend to be an optimist that uh, uh, wise-minded people will, will look at the reality of what's happening on the ground and make some good decisions such that we're not, um, you know, putting individual homeowners or people in, into a uh, needing to worry about whether or not they're gonna have water at their tap uh, anytime in the future. So, well, yeah, they, so. go ahead, Ken. And, and I would like to follow up a little bit on, on both, both Jeff and Dale's um, explanations there with just a little bit of data one thing I think the viewers need to keep in mind, um, when you hear there is a lower basin shortage, it's not a water shortage. It's an, al it's an allocation shortage, basically an excess allocation. Over the last 10 year period, we have delivered out of um, Lake Powell uh, to the lower basin 92.5 million acre feet, which is an average of 9.25 million acre feet a year, well in excess of the seven and a half or eight and a quarter if you include the US-Mexican treaty um, that is required to be de delivered down there. So 
we have a situation where the lower states are, are in a situation of declaring a shortage when they've had, you know, 120% water supply. Uh -huh. That doesn't even fit in our minds up here. Um, you know, a lot of our water up here is the Colorado Big Thompson and Windy Gap projects managed by the Northern Colorado Water Conservancy District. And we rarely have 100%, you know, we, we use, we have years where there's, when it's tighter, um, there's less. And so the water users in Colorado have, have learned over the years to manage their water better. And so they don't allocate every drop of water every single year if it's there, which does happen down below. Um, and to put it in perspective, the reason they're declaring a shortage, you know, Lake Mead and, and Lake Powell are both around 30, one to 35% of storage capacity when they've had over 100% delivery of water every single year, as opposed to the upper basin, which um, the CBT system, which is managed by Northern Water, it is currently as of today, sitting at 80% capacity after we just got done with our high peak usage summer period, we still got 80% capacity in storage and that's, that's a much better managed system. So I think the upper basin, one thing I'd like to assure people around Longmont and around the Northern Colorado is that we have really good water managers in Colorado and that does help. Those two numbers I believe are very telling of how that management, why that management is so important. That's a great, uh, actually that, the, the combination of what you just shared uh, is is a new perspective for me, and I feel like I'm probably paying more closer attention this, to, than the, the average Joe, not nearly as much as folks who are really dialed into water rights and all these issues. But uh, the framing of of um, of usage or the the consumption versus the supply, and the difference between managers who are as concerned about conservation as they are about supply versus just about delivery or over delivery. So, uh, and with the focus on consumption, that's a, that's a great way to frame and understand the difference. Um, so we've all dealt with the same drought. Not everybody's managed the implications the same way. That's what I'm hearing. And who gets credit, Ken, for, for uh, the front range, the, the Northern Colorado, upper Colorado river basin, who gets, who gets, who should we credit for that kind of management? You know, I'd like to credit the water managers and, and the board, like the Northern Board and, and councils. But really, I think who gets credit are the average citizens. I, I just use Longmont as an example. Our citizens have a real and personal water conservation ethic that has absolutely been shown in when you look at the population growth and the versus the demand growth, which is much lower than the population growth, it shows our citizens really do take conservation serious. And so that really, really, really helps. And then on top of that, you know, you do have the managers of the systems saying, hey, when it's a when it's a dry year, we're gonna look really hard at water. We're gonna provide the water we need, but we're not gonna provide excess water during wetter years because we need to keep it for dry years as opposed to but I believe the lower basin just, they overdraft every year <laughs> because they, they've, they have the assurance that we're yeah. sending them down. We got to send them down to seven and a half million acre feet a year. They actually, they actually draft more than the compact and they have for decades. Um, yeah, they have, yeah. I know we're going to drill down uh, or get more focused on Longmont and, and kind of what people ought to know, what we all ought to be mindful of going forward. But since you brought it up, uh, our water consumption on a per capita basis actually has gone down, has it not, year over year for several years. Give okay. us just that kind of quick profile of what, what, a, what a graph would look like in terms of water consumption on a per capita basis in Longmont over the last, say, five years. Yeah, um, well, actually, um, probably the best example is when we first Set, it's been about 15 years ago, we first set a goal of having, uh, you know, by, by kind of sort of build out of the city, of a 10% uh, total water conservation 
uh, savings. Um, we started tracking that 15 years ago, and we've actually just recently met that goal, and we're going to be looking at exceeding that goal and going on past that. Um, but yeah, um, the, the per capita use, um, probably the easiest way to put it in perspective is we've been, Longmont's been using treated water around 18,000 acre feet a year, about 22 to 23,000 acre feet when you include raw water for parks and other uses. We've used about the same amount of water at our current population, which is close to 100,000 that we did 15 years ago, uh, you know, when we were around 75,000. So yeah, pretty our, impressive. It's very impressive yeah. what the citizens have, have responded to that um, request for conservation. All right, so let's let's just uh, get a little more uh, specific in terms of how water, where water gets diverted, where it gets diverted to in the in the upper Colorado basin uh, that that ends up with resident storage facilities like Windy Gap, which we hear about and we'll talk more about in this series. Where does that water, where does that water get diverted? How much of it gets diverted into, into places like specifically Windy Gap? So let me jump on that real quick. As Dale said earlier, we use in Colorado about two and a half million acre feet out of the Colorado River. About a million acre feet of that came after the 1922 compact was signed. So one thing about that compact, everything that was used before 1922 is not subject to being uh, reduced by the compact. So there's a million acre feet that we use in Colorado that's subject to being reduced by Colorado River Compact if something happened there. Uh, half of that million acre feet, or about a half million acre feet, is diverted, what we call Trans Mountain Diversions. It's diverted from the west slope to the east slope. So it's diverted uh, through the Colorado Big Thompson and Windy Gap projects through the Adams Tunnel that goes over into Estes Park. Or, and that's really about 250,000 acre feet, really about half the Trans Mountain diversions are the water that we use in Northern Colorado and Longmont gets a portion of that. Uh, the rest of it uh, goes to Denver and to Colorado Springs and Aurora essentially. So, uh, so you've got uh, this water and most of that water those Trans Mountain diversions are diverted high up in the, you know, in the near the Continental Divide, where it's feasible to drill a tunnel and get, you know, bring the water through to yeah. the other side. Uh, there are some really old irrigation ditches from way back when that actually captured water on the west slope and went through a low spot in the topography and brought that water to the east slope. But there aren't very many of those, and they're a pretty small amount of water. Most of that water comes through the big diversion projects and the big tunnels. And so, you know, uh, really about 250,000 acre feet comes through the Adams Tunnel into Northern Colorado that we serve through the CBT project. If you're familiar with our project, we capture most of that water in Lake Granby, bring it through Grand Lake into Estes Park, down the hill, and it either goes north to Horsetooth and gets fed to Fort Collins and other cities, or it goes south into Carter Lake and gets fed to Longmont, Boulder, and the people further south. So that water is diverted uh, out of Lake, out of Lake Granby and Grand Lake, and brought through the tunnel and, and delivered to the whole Front Range. And generally, and this is a rough estimate, but I, Ken and Dale, you can tell me. But I think for most of the big cities, it's maybe about half of your water comes from the from the Colorado River, and the other half is coming from your local native sources. And that's probably true for Fort Collins and uh, Greeley and other cities as well. Some of the smaller towns may get more of their water actually from Colorado River and very little native supplies. Well, that's probably a pretty good place to put a, a wrap on this conversation, because what it te first of all, this it's kind of a in the in the midst of what is a very troubling weather weather pattern, right? The drought especially in the Western United States that we've all heard so much about and are dealing with, and you, you see it in the, in the, in the, in the, the, the rings, right. That we see so much of now in the news at Lake Mead and Powell, et cetera. Um, maybe we'll come back and talk about how, what condition Blue Mesa, Flaming Gorge and Navajo are, you know, in the next, in the next conversation, but in the midst of a, 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 a troubling, you know, weather pattern, the bad news is if, is if you're an Arizona farmer, 
you, you may be experiencing shortages. The good news is that we've managed well in, in Northern Colorado and Longmonters and other front range communities need not to be losing sleep right now about supply. And uh, we'll, we'll pick up this story in the next segment uh, or the next episode when we, st when we start to talk about supply, what exists and what's coming with the, with the, the Chimney Hollows firming project that's really focused on uh, growing that supply. And Ken, uh, you, you talked about the number of acre feet that we consume in Longmont. Um, when we get into the next conversation, we'll talk about what Chimney Hollows adds to that total square footage uh, or acre, square, uh, acre feet uh, in Longmont and um, uh, what that means for, the, for both for our portfolio and the long-term future of Longmont as we anticipate build out. You know, our master plan gets us to 116,000, give or take a few. I've heard you fellows talk about we'll have su sufficient supplies for more than that as, as Longmont grows out if it, if it were to go beyond that estimate. So we'll get into that in the next episode. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for your, your time today. Uh, the work you do every day, I'm, I'm, you t much of, of it is without, uh, it's not out there in public, it's behind the scenes, it's in service to so many people, uh, both on the, on the West Slope and on the East Slope. Um, everybody is indebted to you guys for the work you do. Uh, they just don't know it. and They don't get to express that thing. So on their behalf, let me say thanks for what you do day in and day out on behalf of everybody uh, in this state, especially in the front range. And I'm going to give you a chance to talk more about that in our next episode. Longmonters, this is just the first half of the backstory on all things water related in Longmont. Next episode, we're going to talk about storage, usage, future uh, policy, and uh, what that all means to us in the years ahead. Thank you, gentlemen. I'm going to see you in the next episode. Longmonters, stay tuned. Thanks, Tim. Thank you.